Well, thank you very much. And um, everybody hear me all right? Yes. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come down here today and I uh, speak to a group of Irish people. I, I couldn't be happier to be in better company. Um, let me start, if I could, with a little uh, Irish humor. Um, this is an old joke, so if you've heard it, I apologize. But um, a, uh, a good Irish boy named Kevin O'Donnell was laying on his deathbed, dying, and his wife, Sinead, was there with him, holding his hand. And they had been married for 50 years, and they had eight children. Seven of the children were fine, upstanding citizens, and the eighth child, Daniel, had never been anything but trouble his whole life and a heartache to his parents. So as he's dying, Kevin looked at his wife and he said, Sinead, I have to know, is Daniel mine? And she looked at him and she said, yes, he's yours. And Kevin died and Sinead looked down and said, but he's the only one. <laughs> Again, if you heard that before, I apologize. But Anyway, I've, I've always felt that creative people make the world uh, better for the rest of us. No matter what um, art form they take, whether they're writing poetry or novels or they're painting or writing music, they have the ability to express things we feel that we have a hard time expressing. They have the ability to take us away from everyday turmoil for a few hours and um, make us feel better. So um, I always wanted to do something along those lines. I, I watched one time an interview with Tom Petty, and they asked him why he was still touring. And he said, if I can take people away from their everyday troubles for two hours, it's all worth it to me. So when my business life started to wind down and I had more time, I decided I wanted to try to write. And I decided I wanted to write historical novels. My first one was, and I've published four, and I put copies out here, but the first one was an Irish immigrant story. See, my mother was a Grady, my father's a Cashman, and I've been to Ireland over 30 times, so uh, it seemed natural that I would start there. And um, you, you certainly want to write something that's entertaining enough that people enjoy reading it. But I also wanted to make several points. First of all, in writing this book, I don't think that the general public has a very comprehensive knowledge of Ireland's great hunger, what it actually was and what the aftermath of it was. It wasn't a famine. I know I'm preaching to a lot of Irish folks here, so much of what I say you may already know. But the so-called Irish famine wasn't a famine because a famine is when there's no food. There was plenty of food in Ireland. It's just that it was restricted as to who could eat it. So to read, to read from the book about it, and, and this was, again, you know, people are very well informed about the Holocaust in this country, as well they should be. But I don't think they're informed enough about the great hunger in Ireland and the people who died from it. So in the book, I tried to make those points. Fully three-fourths of the cultivatable land in Ireland was in other crops than potatoes. Grains, wheats, oat, barley, vegetables, they were all grown all during the Great Hunger. Three quarters of the population, six million out of eight million people at the time, were forced to live on potatoes alone because they were given small tracts of land in order to, um, in order to feed their families. The one quarter of the cultivatable land in Ireland had to feed three quarters of the population. So that left them with little choice but to grow potatoes to eat. And um, when the potato blight hit, there was plenty of other food around. During the entire seven year blight, other crops grown in the country were unaffected. Food exports, including meat, grain, and vegetables, increased while tens of thousands of impoverished 
Irish families starved to death. In the winter of 1846-47 alone, 17 million pounds sterling worth of grain, cattle, pigs, flour, eggs, and poultry were shipped to England, and, and the British sent troops over to Ireland to augment the constabulary to keep the Irish from stealing the food. They weren't allowed to fish. They weren't allowed to eat any of the produce that was, that was being turned out. The British response, as the Celtic peasants, they were a subjugated population under British control. And the British response to the potato blight was tantamount to genocide. Over a million people died, and more than that, left the country to escape the starvation. The, the great hunger in Ireland also had a great deal to do with the Irish Revolution. Skibbereen, for example, was one of the earliest and hardest hit areas in Ireland when um, when the famine hit. As early as 1845, fully one-third of the potato crop was lost in Skibbereen. What's more, the effects of the famine lingered, not just in Skibbereen, but in other places, long after things had begun to improve. Skibbereen became the center of some of the most harrowing suffering in the country. The area was so devastated, and bitterness against the British response was so intense that it became known as the cradle of Fenianism. And I think, as everybody in this crowd knows, the Fenian rebellion grew out of the great hunger in Ireland, as did the Easter uprising, which was the second point I wanted to make in, the, um, in this book. Along with this point, when Irish people came to America, they weren't welcome. I know everybody in the room here probably had ancestors who came over from Ireland, uh, as I did, and, and they weren't welcome when they got here. Um, trying to find my place in the book here. I put paper clips in here to find the places, and then there's so many paper clips I get lost. Just again to read from the book, no group was considered lower than the Irish when they first came to America. They were held in a position of shame and poverty. Those who could read saw their race ridiculed in the American press with lines in major newspapers that read things like, scratch a convict or a pauper, and the chances are that you are tickling the skin of an Irish Catholic. Putting them on a boat and sending them back home would solve the crime problem in America. Harper's Weekly carried a cartoon of an ape-like figure sitting among, amongst a bunch of empty whiskey bottles saying, this is the Irish approach to solving their problems. On a personal note, I had an ancestor who went to a livery stable to get a job dunging out the, um, the livery. Not exactly a great job. When he approached the owner with his Irish accent, the man took him by the hand and led him outside followed by the 12th person workforce. Pointing to a sign, he asked, can you read that? My ancestor shook his head and said that he could not. And the owner of the stable said, of course you can. not You thick effing mix, none of you can read. It says no dogs, no pigs, and no Irish. Now hit the road. And of course, the crew that followed him out um, got a big kick out of that. As he walked away, he could hear the gales of laughter. You know, I, I come from, I live up in the Bangor area, and I went to high school at John Baps High School. It was a Catholic school at the time. It's not now, but it's still there. Um, it was named after Father John Baps. He was tied and feathered by the Ku Klux Klan in Ellsworth, Maine. He was rescued, they left him to die, but he was rescued by a group of Irish Catholics from Bangor who brought him back to Bangor, and he started that high school. The Klan members in Ellsworth were so upset that they rescued him that they were going to destroy St. John's Church, which was a Catholic church in Bangor, still is. 
um, on York Street. So again, the Irish community got together and they stood guard every night until the danger passed to protect the church. The Ku Klux Klan in Maine was there solely for Irish and French Catholics. Um, there wasn't a great black population in Maine, there still isn't. Um, so they were there for one reason. They didn't like the Irish, they didn't like the French, and they didn't like the Catholics. So that's what these two million people who left Ireland for America, that's what they faced. And it wasn't any better in Canada. I have another book that's going to come out soon, I hope, although we're negotiating with publishers and um, so far not successfully. But how many of you know Francis Costello, know who he is? Well, Frank and I wrote it together. It's called, they called her Mother Jones. And if you don't know anything about Mother Jones, you do yourself a favor to Google her. She was an amazing character, born in Ireland, came over to escape the hunger, landed in Canada with her family, and what her family endured in Canada for discrimination was very similar to the types of things I just read uh, that they ran into in America, uh, in the United States. So. Um, hopefully that book will be out this year. Anyway, the, the rebellion, and I looked at your exhibit in the next room, the pictures you have are, are fantastic, really. That's, I, I don't know how you came across it, but uh, they're very interesting to look at. But the Easter rebellion, really, the frustration over the famine led to that event. Obviously, um, there were other things in Irish history that, um, that caused rebellions before the famine. The uh, Acts of Union that they passed in 1799 was not received well, and it spurred the young um, Irish rebellion, as they, they were called the Youthful Irish Rebellion. Um, and the action, uh, the Acts of Union caused, um, the reaction because it was extremely unpopular. And some of the people who um, joined in that rebellion would later join in other rebellions. The idea of Dublin Castle calling all the shots in Ireland was not um, popular with the Irish. And all the frustration and the animosity and the hatred toward Britain that was intensified by the famine and the British response all the suffering and all the deaths, not only intensified feelings in Ireland, the immigration of over a million Irish to America and elsewhere created a whole new problem for the British. Those immigrants carried the scars of the famine with them. The Fenian movement literally grew out of the famine. James Stevens, who escaped to France after the Young Ireland, Irelanders Rebellion, came back to Ireland to form the Irish Republican Brotherhood in 1858. Another escapee from that rebellion, John O'Mahony, founded the sister organization, the Fenian Brotherhood, in America. Both of these organizations were dedicated to Irish independence. Members took an oath when they joined to swear dedication to the cause. The oaths went through several, several different versions, but basically they pledged their allegiance to Irish independence. They raised the, the organization in America founded by James o, John O'Mahony. They raised money throughout America and Canada and sent it back to the, um, to the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which later, of course, became the Irish Republican Army. So the British had created their own problems with the treatment of the Irish, and, and the Irish who left the country became their biggest problem because they sent the money, they sent arms, they sent support to the Irish back in, in Ireland who wanted to free the country. World War I gave the opportunity for the Easter Rebellion. But the Easter Rebellion wasn't popular with everybody in Ireland. There were young Irish people serving in the British military fighting the Germans. So the idea of starting a war with the British while they were fighting the Germans wasn't popular with everybody in Ireland. So when they 
when they attacked, uh, when they took over Dublin on April 24th with 1,200 Irish volunteer force and citizen army members, when they took over Dublin's general post office, the Four Courts, Jacobs Factory, Boland's Mill and South Dublin Union, St. Stephen's Green and the College of Surgeons. And they made the general post office their headquarters. When they did that, on that same day, there was supposed to have been similar events in Cork and in Galway. They never materialized. So the British, in reaction, had only to deal with the situation in Dublin. They sent in 16,000 troops. The British sent in over 16,000 troops and fighting along the roads going into Dublin was fierce. They also sent in gunboats on the Liffey to fire into the city. They, they pretty much destroyed the central post office, which was the headquarters. And obviously they put the rebellion down in short order um, with that number of troops. And with the, um, the Irish not pulling off the other attacks in different parts of the country, it became quite easy for the British to put it down. But they, in typical British fashion, they overreacted. They executed um, the leaders of the rebellion in, within a couple of days of putting the rebellion down. I was just noticing in the other room, you have the picture of De Valera, who was one of the few leaders of the rebellion who wasn't executed. Um, and, but the reaction of the Irish people, remember it was kind of a mixed support for the rebellion in the first place, um, it wasn't it wasn't a hundred percent support from the British people, uh, from the Irish people. But the um, executions were so swift and so brutal that the British were successful in turning all the Irish against them and in favor of of the attack and, and in favor of the drive for independence. So. It began the armed struggle after, the, after they executed the leaders of the rebellion. It began the armed struggle between the IRA and the Black and Tans. The British military carried it on until July of 1921 when there was a truce signed. And uh, as you all know, that truce resulted in the six northern counties in Ulster being split off from the Irish country and made part of Great Britain while the lower 26 counties were given their independence. Um, that, of course, resulted in um, 60 or 70 years of conflict in Ulster until the um, Good Friday Accord that was brokered by a good main boy, Senator George Mitchell. So that's where things stand today, is there's peace in Ireland, but it's still a split country. We still have the um, six northern counties are part of Great Britain, are part of, the, uh, part of Britain while the 26 counties are, are the independent Ireland. Um, I, I wanted, in writing the book, I wanted to make those three points that um, I wanted to emphasize what happened during the famine, I wanted to emphasize how Irish retreated when they came to America, and I wanted to give some history of the revolution. But whenever you write a book, there's a little piece of you in the book. And if you've, if you've read the book already, which you should have, by the way, if you haven't, I got copies here you can buy. But um, the main character um, owns a store on Derby Street in Salem. How many of you have been to Salem, Mass? Well, Derby Street was the Irish section. It's where the House of Seven Gables is. That's on Derby Street. That was the Irish section of uh, Salem back in the day. And my great-grandfather, John H. Cashman, owned a store on Derby Street along with his brother, Tom. So in the book, the main character owns a store on Derby Street, um, which is exactly where my great-grandfather's was, and he marries a girl who lived across the street named Anastasia Shallow, and that would be my great-grandmother. And in the book, 
um, the main character's wife and mother die of influenza within a month of each other. And that's also uh, true of my family. So I put a bit of my family in the book and um, I put a lot of history in the book, history of Ireland, history of the Great Hunger and so forth. And um, I guess that's pretty much true of all the books I've written. The last thing I mentioned is I also put a lot in there about John L. Sullivan, who was the first recognized um, undisputed heavyweight boxing champion of the world. And he was champion from 1882 to 1892. While he was champion, he went over to Ireland and challenged the British champion who um, decided that discretion was a better part of valor and he chose not to fight John L. Sullivan. But Sullivan was just such an interesting character that I wanted to put him in the book. He was a hero to the Irish when they really, really needed one. He would go into a major city like Chicago and put an ad in the paper. Anyone who can last three rounds with me, he'd give him a hundred dollars. Nobody could do it. He fought most of his fights bare-fisted. And um, just a great character. There have been books written about him. I put him in here and I put some of his fights in here and I made him a friend of the main character so that he went, my main character went over to Ireland with John L. Sullivan. And um, anyway, it's all blended in the same story. They just did a, an article in Bangor, in the Bangor paper uh, for St. Patrick's Day about the uh, Irish immigrants who came to Bangor. And they ended it, they ended the article with a line it says, when you celebrate St. Patrick's Day in the history of the Irish people in Maine and the United States, you're really celebrating the proud history of immigrants in this country from all over the globe who sought a better life in a new community in their adopted home. And um, I think that's a very accurate statement. I don't think any nationality who immigrated over here, most of them faced adversity and they still do today. So, um, that's a summation of the book. I um, hope it was informative and I'd be glad to answer any questions. As I said, I have copies of it here if you'd like to buy a copy after we're done. I'd be glad to autograph it for you.